Hi, this is Amir Arzani, Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Northern Arizona University, and I'm going to talk about a hybrid physics space and data-driven modeling of neural blood flow with physics-informed neural networks. So in uh, cardiovascular fluid mechanics, we are interested in wall shear stress, which is probably the most or one of the most important parameters in cardiovascular flow modeling, and it tells us different types of information. We can use wall shoots to study endothelial cell mechanotransduction, which is known to regulate vascular wall remodeling and vascular health. And also, uh, I have my lab has shown that a wall shoots vector fields play a very important role in regulating near wall mass transport processes that occur in major forms of vascular disease, such as atherosclerosis and thrombosis. Now, the main... Uh, problem here is that we cannot really translate volatile stress for routine clinical practice. And there are different difficulties here. Uh, volatile stress is a multifaceted parameter. We do not fully understand how it influences vascular disease. So uh, we have used the vector field topology and its hidden information to kind of uncover uh, some new information here in a series of work. And then and the other issue is that uh, we do not really have a reliable technology for high fidelity quantification of wall shear stress. And today I'm gonna to talk about how we can use scientific machine learning to address this problem. So if you take a closer look at the wall shear stress vector field, so here's an example in a brain aneurysm, uh, what we see is that the wall shear stress vector field is really complicated. You have multi-directional behavior, you have different types of wall shear stress fixed points, topological behavior, and that makes it really difficult to quantify and characterize. And actually, if you look into different vascular uh, flow domains, you see these complex patterns happening. Even in a healthy ascending aorta, you see this complicated uh, wall shear stress vector field, multi-directional vector field patterns happening. Now, we have different technologies to quantify wall shear stress. We can use a 4D flow MRI to directly measure wall shear stress inside the body. But the problem is that MRI has low spatial resolution, which makes it very, very difficult to compute gradients in velocity near the wall. So therefore, we cannot really get wall shear stress accurately. And then we can also use in vitro techniques such as PIV. But the problem with PIV is that if we're interested in patient-specific modeling, um, it has uncertainty in boundary conditions and uh, parameters. And also PIV is known to have some limitations in near wall flow quantification. Finally, we can use high resolution CFD. Uh, and with, by using high resolution, we can minimize numerical error. However, still we have the issue of uncertainty in boundary conditions and parameters when we're doing uh, high resolution CFD for patient specific applications. And what really makes all of this uh, worse is that you know wall shear stress is much more sensitive to modeling limitations compared to other hemodynamic measures such as pressure drops. That makes it really really difficult to build a high fidelity technology for its quantification. So today I'm going to talk about how we can use scientific machine learning to address some of these issues. Um, so in scientific machine learning, we uh, the difference between scientific machine learning and traditional machine learning is that in scientific machine learning, we don't have the luxury of having large data sets. So you know, often we have low amount of data, they're sparse, they're, they have low quality, it could be incomplete. Uh, and that makes it, so that's what makes it different from classical machine learning. And also in scientific machine learning, we're usually interested in physical variables. So in our case, hemodynamics. So now the main idea of this work is that can we develop scientific machine learning methods to overcome uncertainty issues in computational models and also low resolution in experimental quantification of hemodynamics? Or in other words, can we get the best of these both worlds, experimental measurement and computational modeling? So I have used different approaches to um, and tackle this problem. So we have uh, developed uh, different data-driven modeling techniques based on sparse representation in our Royal Society paper. We have also developed a reduced order Kalman filter approach to do data assimilation. But uh, today I'm gonna to talk about our most recent work, which is the physics-informed neural network, PIN work. Okay, so in PIN, uh, we are, uh, constructing a hybrid physics-based and deep learning approach using uh, deep neural networks. 
so uh, the input, so really in P, we're interested in approximating velocity and pressure as a function of space and time. Um, and uh, we can have as, as our objective or really last function in our training, we can have the mathematical equations. So we can satisfy given mathematical models. So in our case, the Navier-Stokes equations and also boundary conditions if we have them. And also if you have measurement data, we can also add an experimental data loss to our optimization problem. So we're essentially finding velocity and pressure as a function of space and time such that our given mathematical equations as well as experimental data are satisfied. Um, so, uh, so the nice thing here is that, you know, if we have mathematical models that are not perfect, so let's say they have uncertainty, and we also have measurement data that are not perfect either, you could combine them with PIN to get, you know, really, really accurate results. Um, and, um, Here's an example of using PIN as a forward, forward solver. So this is an alternative to finite element method or you know, really your favorite CFD solver. Uh, so if we are given a well-posed problem, and by that I mean, let's say we have all the boundary conditions, all the parameters, the geometry, and anything we really need to solve a CFD problem. So if you have all of that, we can use PIN as an alternative to a traditional CFD solver to solve for the flow. So in this case, we have a 2D blood flow problem in a stenosis. On the top, we have the PIN solution using PyTorch. On the bottom, we have the CFD solution using Phoenix, which is an open source uh, finite element solver. Uh, and um, what we see is that PIN does a very good job of getting the correct solution. Um, but now, so the main advantage that PIN offers here is that it's a mesh-free approach. You don't really need to uh, create a mesh, you just specify the points where you're interested in finding your solution. But the main disadvantage is that it's really, really slow compared to a uh, traditional CFD solver. Okay, so it's, so PIN, in my opinion, is not really attractive for solving a well-posed forward problems because you know, at this point we have excellent CFT solvers that can do that. So what makes PIN attractive is that when we have an ill-posed problem. So let's see, the, let's define the problem that we're interested in. So let's say we have, um, we're interested in solving for wall shear stress in an aneurysm domain. So this is a, a brain aneurysm example. And um, let's say uh, we have, um, uh, we do not know the boundary conditions. So let's say the inlet and outlet I uh, do not have boundary conditions. Um, and uh, let's say we have uh, sparse measurements away from the wall. So in the blue region, I have some experimental data, okay? So can I combine this information in PIN to find wall shear stress? So, you know, if I had the boundary conditions, I could directly solve my problem with CFT, but I don't have them, right? I only know the geometry, I don't know the inlet and outlet boundary condition. And also my experimental data are away from the wall. They're not near the wall because as I said before, the experimental measurement near the wall is challenging. So I only trust my experimental data in the region away from the wall. So I can't get wall stresses from my experimental data either. So this is a problem that we want, we're going to be talking about today. And the goal is, of course, to find wall shear stress. So here's a proof of concept. Let's consider a simple 1D advection diffusion equation. So this is a simple mass transfer problem. And we're often interested in these types of problems in cardiovascular modeling when we're studying uh, biotransport and atherosclerosis or thrombosis. So if you, know, if you know the boundary conditions, you can, in this 1D case, you have an analytical solution, so you can find this analytical solution. But now the problem that we want to solve is that, let's say I don't know the boundary conditions. So let's say C1 and C2, I do not know them, right? And however, I have three measurement sensors. So these three red crosses that you see, I know my concentration at these three points. So now I can use PIN to find the best concentration that satisfies these three measurement points. And also it satisfies the governing equation. So it makes this residual zero. But of course, it's not imposing any boundary condition at the end. And if you look into this, you can see that PIN gives you very, very accurate results. Okay, um, now for the more complex 2D and 3D examples I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna be using a high resolution CFT to generate my ground truth data. So the CFT solver that I'm using is OSIS, which is an open source finite element CFT solver developed in Phoenix uh, that my lab often uses. 
And in, in Oasis, we can use high resolution P2, P1 elements. These are quadratic elements and without any stabilization. So that makes it a really, really minimally dissipative CFD code. And this, the Oasis uses the, the IPCS method, which is um, um, a fancy extension of Turing's a classical fractional steps method. And you know that makes it attractive because it's you know, at each step, it solves for velocity and pressure separately. So you, the linear systems that you get to solve are much simpler compared to a, a coupled up UP approach where you have to solve for velocity and pressure at the same time. So that makes it a bit faster than those uh, UP approaches. Okay, uh, now here's the problem that we want to solve. So let's consider a 2D brain aneurysm example. And I don't know the inlet and outlet boundary conditions, right? If I knew them, I could solve the problem easily with CFD. So my boundary conditions at the inlet and outlet are unknown. I do know the geometry, so I do know the no-slip boundary condition. And at the same time, I have five measurement points. These are very, very sparse measurement points that away from the wall, right? So I know the solution of these five points. My goal is to find wall shear stress. And if you compare the sensors to the CFD mesh, you can see that they're really, really coarse, right? The experimental measurement points, they're really, really sparse and coarse. So if you solve this problem, here's the results. On the top, you have the reference solution. At the bottom, the pin solution. And um, what you see is that, um, um, so now, so one, one observation is that if you look into the pin solution, I'm only solving it in uh, the region of interest. Right in the aneurysm region. I don't need to go all the way to the inlet and outlet. And that's another advantage of PIN is that you can you know, apply your PIN framework locally in your region of interest. And the reason here I don't need to solve all the way to the inlet and outlet is because I don't know my boundary conditions at the inlet and outlet. Right, so I can just focus in the region that matters to me. And if I do this problem, the wall shear stress that I get, if you compare it to the reference CFT wall shear stress, you can see that you get very, very accurate results with PIN. However, if you look into the inlet flow that PIN recovered and you compare it to the reference solution, you can see that PIN uh, you know, found another inlet flow pattern that actually produces this correct sensor data and also the correct flow dynamics inside the annuals, right? Uh, so, so therefore the correct wall shear stress patterns. So that's an interesting observation because there are multiple solutions that you can get in this inverse problem. So in inverse problems, we usually don't have, a, sometimes you don't have a unique solution. There are multiple solutions we can find. Now we can do the same thing for a stenosis problem. And if you look into the wall shoot stress data, which is in the region distal to the plaque where my sensors were located at, I get very, very accurate wall shoot stress results by only using five sensors in this domain. And, but again, if you look into the pins, what pin recovers as the inlet boundary condition, you can see it's different from the ground truth inlet boundary condition, but it doesn't matter because the flow that develops in the region of interest is going to be the same flow for the both cases. And therefore I'm getting the correct uh, wall shear stress results. And we can also extend this uh, you know, framework to a 3D example. So this is a 3D brain aneurysm example. And again, we get a pretty good, a nice, uh, results for wall shear stress uh, quantification. And we've also looked into the effect of sensor numbers. So in the 2D examples, if you reduce the sensor even down to three sensors, uh, you can still get pretty accurate results. Uh, so you can see, for example, in the brain aneurysm example, you can see slight reduction in accuracy of wall shear stress, but the method still uh, does a very good job of getting wall shear stress. And we can also do another type of problem. So let's say instead of having the boundary conditions be unknown, let's say I don't know my viscosity. And, and this happens, for example, when you have, you're dealing with a diabetes patient, right? In diabetes, you have you know, variations in viscosity and rheology properties of blood. Uh, so uh, let's say if I don't know the viscosity, but I have my Navier-Stokes equations, I have my five sparse sensor measurements, and I want to combine the two in, um, in my pin and find viscosity. So if you do that, uh, you can see that after 2000 iterations, uh, PIN can you know, uncover the correct viscosity uh, um, for this problem. Okay, and we've also done a bit more complicated problems as well. So this is work uh, I uh, did with uh, Roshan de Souza's group. Roshan de Souza, who is a quarter in this talk. Uh, so here, we, what we did was that we took a 40 flow MRI data and we did a super resolution and denoising of 40 flow MRI data with PIN. So let's say you have this middle panel, right? You have blood flow in aneurysm. So it's, you know, it's coarse, it's 
it's noisy. And then so you can directly take this, apply pin to it to make get this high resolution, nice data. And what makes this different from classical deep learning approaches is that, you know, here we did not train this with hundreds of patients or, or to get these results. You directly go from this panel to this panel without any expensive offline training. It's like directly you're going from this one, only this data to the correct data. And that's all because of the mathematical equations, the physics that we can embed into our deep learning framework. Okay, so to conclude, scientific machine learning lets us combine the best of what computational experimental modeling has to offer. We can use PIN to get highly accurate Walsh-Schuster's results by blending uncertain mathematical models with sparse measurements away from the wall. And we can use the method to improve experimental quantification of near wall flow and also perhaps even computational quantification. And um, so we can, as I said, we can move towards the best of both worlds of what experimental and computational hemodynamics modeling has to offer. So for future work, I would like to do pulse data flows, patient specific geometries, and we also like to test our method on real world PIV and MRV data. So more details about this work could be found in this archive paper. I'd like to thank my students and also funding sources for uh, this study. Uh, thank you.